question. So you're, mm -hmm. you're not like stuck with Tor, but you, you've done so much with them. Is it true that both breach of protocol to go with different publishing houses at all? Or is, is that no. Um, with some caveats. Um, so, when and if you get a um, contract, and we'll start listing these, and I'll leave these up here so you can, you can see them. One of the things that exists in contracts is something we call a right of first refusal. So, a uh, right of first refusal is um, usually contains two types of clauses. The first one is you have to show it to us first. If you, for me, for instance, my right of first refusal is tour is for is series tied. So, for instance, I have to show them the next way of King's book. They have rights of first refusal on books in the Stormlight Archive. Anything I write in the Stormlight Archive, they get to see first. Second piece of a right of first refusal clause is usually I am not allowed to take less from another publisher for it. For instance, if Tor offers on it, I can't then go and sell it to someone else for less money. I can go, I can say no, that deal isn't good enough, and go sell it to someone else for, for more money. You will often see in rights of first refusal clauses things that say, if it, you go to someone else and they offer, offer more, we have a chance to beat that price by a certain amount or to match it or beat it. You know, The, the Amazon first breakout and breakthrough novel contract, um, it has the, if you go to someone else, um, our publisher gets a chance to, off, um, to, to match plus 10%, and then you have to take that. Unless then you go to another publisher or the other people, and they, they up it then, it, they always get a chance to match, or, in, or whatever the, the terms are, match plus 10 or something like that. Okay? So those are the two parts of a right of first refusal clause. Um, sometimes the, the first clause, um, the first part, you have to show it to us, and it'll, it'll include a, we get a certain period of time in order to look at it. Say we've got a six-month leader on it or whatnot. So these are actually clauses written down official. This isn't just a etiquette. Thing. No, no, this is, this will be in your contract. Okay. okay. So that's one thing to be aware of that exists. It exists in almost every book contract out there. All right. Things to watch out for is a time period, uh, um, a, a, how should I say, too broad. Watch out for something that's too broad. Did I spell broad right? Um, so something that's too broad would be, for instance, there were certain contracts in the LDS publishing world that had a, gave them a first refusal right on any work produced by the author for the next 10 years. OK? That's crazy. That is absolute crazy talk. Don't sign a contract that says that. Yeah. Um, no. Every, every thing to remember with contracts is everything is negotiable. Even the stuff they say that's non-negotiable, they don't mean it. Okay. Everything is negotiable. So don't don't sign a sign right of first refusal. It's too broad. Very common rights of first refusal are any book in this series or your next novel in the same genre. If you sell to a YA publisher, usually they will, <coughs> they will say, we want first refusal rights on your next novel made, um, written for the children's market. Very common, very acceptable. It's something that you should say yes to. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that. Now, if you have an agent or mm -hmm. a contract lawyer, they're going to pick up on a lot of this stuff. They are going to pick up on a lot of this stuff, assuming they know what they're doing. Um, but I want you... Part of your job is to learn this business so that you can tell if an agent or a, a, um, an entertainment attorney is doing their job. If you see something like this that raises a red flag and your attorney or agent doesn't, then they're wrong and you're with the wrong type of attorney or agent. Okay. Now, I'm not going to teach you all the subtle language because I don't know it all. All the very, very subtle languages that exist in contracts, but I can tell you the big clauses that are going to be in there and teach you to spot what is industry standard and what is not. All right? And this is very important for you, I feel. So, right of first refusal is one of those things that's going to be in a contract. Now, to answer the original question, um, I've been with Tor for a long time. I've like, liked how Tor has treated me. Can I go somewhere else? Yes, I could. Um, will there be bad feelings? 
Yes, there will be, but not as bad a feeling as you assume there will be. Authors do it all the time. It is usually a, it's, it's a, it's not burning a bridge, but it's putting up a four construction sign on the bridge that is going to be hard to get around. For instance, some authors will, you know, have just a very bad experience with their publisher and they'll go somewhere else. It's very rare they're going to go back, but they could. So the relationship with your agent is completely different. Than yes, your relationship with your agent is very different from the agent with your author or with your publisher. Breaking up with an agent is far more rare than moving um, between publishers with, um, with, with something. Yes. It's a novella. Okay. Um, and Tor doesn't do small print run novellas. Uh, so I went with uh, Subterranean Press. And you'll find it very common. Most commonly, if a big author is doing something with another publisher, it's for a specialty book like this. Um, I mean, Legion is, um, is 17,000 words. It's tiny uh, for a book of mine. It wouldn't do well. It, it, anyway, just not, so yeah. No, like, or oh, no, not at all. Um, and in fact, if I wrote this as if I novelized it, I would then take it to Tor. Um, so, so there are no hard feelings. My ed editor at Tor actually gave me feedback on it before I took it to Subterranean Press, just for, fr for free. Um, another question. OK, getting a new editor. This is a side topic, but we'll go ahead and mention it. It is possible to get a new editor at the same publisher if it isn't working with you. Um, it doesn't happen that commonly, but I'd say it's more common than breaking up with um, an agent is. Um, you, so you should know that it is possible. It depends on the publisher. If it's a large publisher, it's more possible. If it's a small publisher, obviously if they only have two editors, it, you know, jumping from one to the other is going to do you much less good because usually the, if there's only two editors, they'll have a very similar editorial style and things like that, but it is possible. Um, so. I, I wouldn't, I hope it never has to happen to you. What happens more often is you get orphaned, which is your editor gets a better job at a new company. Um, like most businesses, one of the main ways to move up is to move to another company. And so then your editor leaves, they have acquired the books, they were shepherded them, and they fall in someone else's lap. And what happens there can, you know, it, it, can, it can make a major stumble for the series. Um, it happens all the time though. Um, it happened to me with Alcatraz. Um, we lost our editor after the first book. Um, and so, yeah, you'll, you have that possibility. It's one of the nice things about having an agent that you have chosen wisely with and well, because the agent will remain the same generally throughout your career, but you'll generally work with several editors. All right. Other questions there? The, um, another clause in your contract is going to be uh, we'll just kind of start from the beginning. You will have an advance. This is all for novels, by the way. We'll talk about short stories separately. You will have an advance. The contract will spell out how much your advance is and your break points on your advance, your payment um, when you get paid. Usually, I've seen it like this. One half on signing, one half on publication. That's very common. Um, also common is the one-third signing, one-third acceptance, meaning acceptance of the manuscript. Um, you've edited it and revised it according to their, um, their desire. One-third then on pub. Um, once you start getting to really big advances, they start chopping and dicing this thing right and left. Uh, I think on um, Stormlight Archive, we have one part on signing, one part on delivery, one part on acceptance, one part on hardcover publication, one part on paperback publication. Well, no, and one part on bestseller list um, registration. So we actually have, we have six, I think, or something like that. Um, because my advance now um, is directly tied to where I place on the bestseller list. So if I hit number one, um, I make you know, a big ton uh, more money than if I make number seven or something like that. Um, and this is all advance against royalties. Advance is against royalties. You all, I've explained this to you, you all understand that? No one's confused by advance against royalties? Okay, good. You don't need to pay the advance back ever unless you don't deliver the manuscript. Sometimes they'll go after you on that case. 
All right. So um, that's a piece of a contract. Another piece of the contract then will be royalties. Um, I believe I gave you a breakdown on royalties before, did I not? I don't think I'll spend time going over that again. You'll know what your, um, your royalty should be. Just as a reminder, industry standard on hard cat covers is somewhere between 10 and 15 percent. Industry standard on paperbacks is going to be somewhere between 6 and 10 percent, usually more around the 8 percent. And that's off cover price. Industry standard um, right now, unfortunately, on ebooks is 25 percent of net. Net being defined as proceeds paid to the publisher, not after they've taken out all their expenses. If anything, ha they're, they're saying after expenses, big red flag, OK? Watch out for after expenses, because that's what we term Hollywood accounting. Um, they use it in the mu music industry also. It means that uh, you get an advance, and then they count profits after their investors have been paid back which means they don't make profits because their investors get all the money. This is why Hollywood films can make no money. Okay, Lord of the Rings movies did not make profit according to Hollywood accounting. You understand this? We've talked about this. That's what the big lawsuit was about. Um, so there will be a royalty.